Are we able to see the screen? Yes. So, hello everyone, and uh, thank you for that introduction once again. A uh, very good day, evening, afternoon, from where we are joining in. I'm Divya Mohan, and as um, introduced, I work with HSBP as a senior system plan administrator. And it's Kegwa, though, um, before I start out, whatever I speak of today um, is not related to uh, what, um, I mean, is not related to my work at HSBC uh, and is not endorsed or promoted by them. Uh, these are learnings that I have uh, gained via uh, my journey in open source and particularly in chaos engineering. Uh, that being said, today I am going to be speaking about uh, something that's not really uh, anybody's favorite topic, uh, failure. So uh, don't worry, there's no network glitch, you've not um, sort of uh, stumbled into a webinar or a TED talk. Uh, wherein people are going to coach you about how to feel better. Um, but yeah, uh, failure in software and systems um, is something that uh, we encounter as IT professionals and we work on remediating them. And it's also something that we uh, specifically uh, encounter as end users of various uh, mobile as well as web applications that we use on a day to day basis. Um, so um, we painstakingly create uh, all uh, this beautiful software for our end users and um, uh, failure is something, uh, you know, that 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 is inevitable, irrespective of how well designed or how um you know well architected the solution is and um even though it's not a sort of solution and uh, even though it's not sort of, sort of the thing that is um you know encouraged in a, a real-time outage but uh, failure does have benefits in terms of uh, learning and uh, gaining knowledge from failure and that is where we are going to start from today so Okay, sorry, um, just a second. So why is failure necessary? And uh, that, that, that is the very first thing anybody would be asking us, right? Um, if, if you can design the best application and if it will never ever fail, uh, that would be the most ideal scenario ever. So um, especially when you're on the com uh, consumer side of uh, the application, failure isn't tolerated and uh, but probably because most of our lives revolve around such applications. But like I said a couple of minutes before, um, failure is something that we uh, learn from and we uh, can, you know, better our experience the next time if we learn from that set um, occurrence. So it is as essential, if not more, in learning um, and understanding more about our application. Um, so I'm only a Netflix binge watcher, honestly, just like all of you folks here. But I'm sure uh, this is something that even uh, the folks who uh, initiated the discipline of chaos engineering in Netflix thought of um, way back in 2012. Of course, there wasn't a formal name to this uh, discipline back then, but today it is what we know as chaos engineering. And uh, what we think of chaos engineering, what exactly is it? So um, chaos engineering is basically um, how we as folks in, um, in the information technology sector um, fulfill our quest to provide software that is more available and more uh, resilient um, for our customers. Chaos engineering is a discipline that allows for us to do this. And uh, how does it do it is the very first question because um, all of this is um, no, uh, I mean, this is no experiment all talk. So how, how are we actually doing this? Uh, so in chaos engineering, uh, there is something called as an experiment and um, experiments uh, in, in this particular, um, you know, discipline are very similar to what we uh, think of as testing, but 
the there is a different uh, there is a difference between experiments and testing in the sense that in testing you know the end result like if i give input as a there will be the output as b that that is a known that is a known thing and that is something you can control but in case of a chaos experiment you are um sort of subjecting the software or the application or a specific part of the infrastructure to a, a particular amount of um uh, cpu or increasing its memory consumption or increasing its disk space usage to see what will happen in case this actually does occur in a real life situation so your experiments are roughly the equivalent of real life experiments and they are they also have an element of testing because um you do not really know what is there at the output even though you are the one first uh, you are the one giving the input from uh, the other side so since we spoken about chaos experiments let us see what they are not um they are not something that can be randomly conducted because uh, to in order to gain knowledge and in order to learn from the failure um we need to understand precisely what is um, what is happening when we conduct that experiment so it cannot be a random test that you decide to conduct one fine day when you get up that that definitely is not the case and you cannot be randomly executing the chaos experiment as well why because if the target radius or if the blast radius as in a chaos engineering experiment is significantly larger it might become difficult to control what we learn from the experiment and maybe we might end up not learning much and degrading the system's performance eventually so you cannot be executing uh, chaos engineering experiments randomly um also like i said before when we are uh, conducting or executing these experiments we need to have a really good idea of what we are expecting to learn like if we know this is the target if we know this is the control that we are putting in we need to understand what uh, we are seeking to learn from it because without understanding that bit we do not we do not gain Uh, we do not stand to gain much from the experiment um, outputs and last but not the least i mean this is like the base of all experiments you need to have a very clear understanding of what the architectural components within the software are it should not be the case that you one day or uh, you decide that uh, you are having a game day or you are conducting a chaos experiment and then you suddenly realize um, oh uh, there is this new component that we did not uh, figure out was a part of this and we now need to know more about this so that is that is going to totally set you off the path and you need to have uh, subject matter experts preferably um, as well as every every stakeholder who is part of this um, part of this uh, designing maintaining supporting um, and developing the software as part of the chaos experiment because chaos engineering as much as it is about the tools technology and it's as fancy a word um, as it is a nascent discipline it is also about the people involved and it is also about the processes involved so we definitely need to take everything into consideration before uh, you know performing a chaos experiment now one of the very uh, uh, common myths that i have encountered uh, when speaking to people about chaos engineering is that uh, they have this misconception in their mind that chaos engineering is a cloud native uh, uh, you know sort of discipline only And that really couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, it's of course easier to implement in cloud native architectures because of the wider variety of tools that are available. Sure, I mean that's definitely there. But um, any system that is distributed is inherently going to fail. And chaos engineering is basically sort of experimenting and po po positioning yourself in such a way. 
that when uh, that you conduct experiments on that particular um, application or software in order to understand that when it fails, what do you do? So it can be implemented in any distributed systems and you do not need to have fancy uh, chaos engineering tools. Uh, for example, for as an example, when I started out with chaos engineering, I really did not know much. It was last year and uh, I had recently just come out of um, uh, hosting a community day back in Pune. This was before the virus began. So uh, I basically did not know much. And all I knew was that it was a really um, fascinating discipline that I wanted to be a part of. And the very first thing that I did by myself was to set up a Kubernetes cluster, uh, which again was something that I learned last year. And um, I managed to sort of inject, um, you know, chaos um, by using, um, you know, the litmus chaos tool. And that was a very, very basic setup. And it was not something that I um, imagined doing, but you can start small. Now, litmus chaos is a tool, I know that, but you can, I, you can also simulate chaos with the help of uh, scripting, with the help of automation. And that's completely possible and is something you should do if you are not, um, you know, if you're not able to uh, get your hands on the proprietary tools like uh, Gremlin, etc. You you can start small and that's something that you should, uh, you know, start uh, working towards because um, all of us want what is best for our customers and all of us want to provide the highest availability and highest amount of residency to the applications that we designed for them. So now, um, obviously, when I'm speaking about chaos engineering, the first question is, what are the benefits? I mean, all of this is cool. Uh, you, you, It sounds like a fancy term. It's a nascent technology. There are tools available. But what are the benefits? How do you convince the business? And uh, how? Uh, what, what effect does it have on the customer? So number one, Customers um, are really not bothered about what's uh, what what technical stack you use or how you manage to keep their uh, applications running. They just care about whether the application is available at the time of um, them accessing it. That's that's it. So when we actually onboard the discipline of chaos engineering, we have better mean time to recovery. And why do we have that is when we engage all the relevant stakeholders in a chaos experiment, we figure out, we carry out the experiment uh, under the correct control conditions, we're able to gauge what, um, what sort of response is required when that particular component actually fails uh, in production. And when it does fail, you know better. To, and you're able to recover faster. So the customers are, I mean, they will be affected, but they are affected to a lesser extent as they would be should you be unprepared. So that is one thing. And um, with the amount of automation and with the amount of um, you know flexibility a lot of the chaos engineering tools offer, um, you have automated health checks, you have uh, uh, you have automated health checks that you can carry out prior, during, and post the experiment. And some of these health checks can actually help you uh, lessen the number of outages that actually occur. So happy customers, I guess that brings up to the next level, that is the business. So happy customers is one bit, but uh, convincing the business to invest money in a tool or in a technology is a totally different ballgame. Um, so when we talk about chaos engineering, um, we definitely uh, are talking about improved uh, improvement in the operation and maintenance flows. Because once we realize that a particular um, a particular way of working or a particular process or a particular uh, stream of people are um, you know are not functioning as expected during the recovery procedure. Um, and this is what needs to be changed. You obviously have, um, you obviously have improved uh, improvements from a uh, from a workflow perspective, and this not only leads to um, 
improvement just in the operational maintenance workflow but it but when an actual incident occurs like i said before uh, the management of the incident is again easier uh, because people don't have to be running around uh, sourcing knowledge documentation talking uh, to smes calling up folks who are not on call um, towards you know recovering a service so that that sort of um, is is better for the business because lesser number of incidents the business is also happy and of course when you uh, combine both the first and the second point you look at uh, reducing the number of losses prevention is obviously a very uh, far flung term because uh, that's that's not something that's totally achievable but reduction in the number of losses is completely achievable and is something that um, chaos engineering helps with and the last but not the least of course these uh, technical folks like uh, myself and like all the others who are attending the event um or who are watching it they we are the folks who are uh, you know involved in the remediation of an issue or we are the folks who are called in during a particular outage um in that case uh, most of us are SMEs, most of us are technical support staff. You could be a developer, and um, when we actually have in experiments that sort of document and uh, better the processes, it's obviously contributing towards a reliable system. And what do reliable systems have as a um, benefit? You have lesser on calls. Why? Because they fail lesser. So technical people also happy. So. I don't. Uh, these are the main few benefits that uh, Chaos Engineering offers you. And now we come to the tools available because obviously all of this sounds great on paper and it sounds like um, uh, an IT professional's dream come true. Now there are around uh, 20, 25 ish tools that are available to the best of my knowledge, and both of them are, I mean, they are included in both the categories, proprietary as well as uh, uh, open source. So I personally cannot be going through each one of them to think conscious of time because there are other speakers uh, who are lined up after me. So I'll be speaking uh, in detail about uh, the ones that I have experimented with uh, specifically. And uh, you definitely should go and check some of these out. So Chaos, uh, Chaos uh, Monkey is one of the earliest tools that was uh, made available by uh, Netflix. And it sort of, um, I can't say made the tool, it sort of uh, is, um, it sort of, um, I mean, made, I mean, I don't have a better word for this. So it was made or introduced by Netflix in 2012, which was nine years back. So obviously, that, that with the passage of time, uh, you can imagine that um, the components and uh, you know the so setup, the things required for setup, are a little more obsolete as compared to the tools that have come there after. So in case of Chaos Monkey, it requires the setup of Spinnaker and a MySQL. Uh, coupled with uh, uh, a longer deployment time and with a limited number of um, attacks that are possible, uh, this is not really a feasible tool to deploy in your organization at an enterprise level. Although it's a great tool to start experiment with, uh, experimenting with when you know you're on the way towards adopting chaos engineering, you should definitely try it out. Um, the next one is uh, Litmus Chaos, and uh, at the risk of sounding like a mar marketing pitch, I am the Sigdox lead for Litmus Chaos, and I know the tool a little bit better. So that's another tool that I've experimented with. It currently runs only on Kubernetes platforms and was released in the year uh, 2018. It's a CNCF sandbox project as of now, and we are looking towards becoming an incubating project this year, I guess. So it was created for the system solution of uh, uh, Open EBS, which is a storage solution for Kubernetes. Um, and Open EBS, again, as you guessed it, is um, open source. It's um, it 
the creators are Maya data. Now, uh, as opposed to Chaos Monkey, yeah, Litmus Chaos has a plethora of experiments that uh, you can find on the Chaos Hub. And uh, the best feature about this, like I said before, is um, there is a feature for health checking the uh, application before, after, and during the experiments. And this feature is known as the Litmus Pro. Um, and it is also useful because you can automate your error detection and thereby correction. Um, and also, if, if your system becomes sort of unsteady during the experiment, it's very um, useful at halting the experiment. Um, now, we are not Banata Falls, and like I said, this is not a marketing pitch. Um, we have a steep entry level barrier in terms of, you know, setting up and, uh, um, uh, you know, setting up in general. And uh, it, it does help with the security bit of the product, but uh, it's something that uh, we uh, recognize is a steep entry level barrier and we are working to better document it and uh, that's where I'm hope that's where I've helped and I'm hoping to help in the coming year now the next this slide and the next three slides are about the tools available in the market and uh, uh, since I began my journey um, with open source and with litmus uh, and with litmus chaos in the chaos engineering space um, I, I could speak about them. Chaos Monkey was made available by Netflix, so I actually had the chance to experiment. But uh, you you may feel free to go and look at the number, the tools available other than these two. And uh, they are classified on the basis of various things. So there are uh, tools that are specifically um, you know, related to networking. Uh, they are, there are tools that are specific to platforms. Uh, that they support. There are tools that support both on-prem as well as cloud. So the differentiation in the tools is on a lot of um, characteristics. It's not specifically that one tool is better than the other. So basis the tool that you want to, uh, based on, you know, uh, uh, part of infrastructure, a part of software that you're targeting, you obviously can onboard one or more than one of these tools. Now, um, all of this is cool. Uh, where do I start? Because uh, why, why, why would I uh, give a long lecture about something and not tell you how to start uh, start with the whole process? So, in an organization, uh, from an organizational perspective, rather, you can have entire teams like Netflix dedicated to chaos engineering, or uh, as early adopters of chaos engineering uh, have depicted you can have specific critical uh, in infrastructure teams uh, that uh, control critical components like storage database network adopting chaos engineering towards bettering resiliency of their part of the infrastructure now um, obviously this does not benefit uh, uh, your application specifically if you're a developer, but it works towards bettering an entire uh, suite of uh, infrastructure. And uh, if, if you're an enterprise level company, it makes more sense to have that, I guess. So when we speak about uh, where you can get started personally, uh, we have a lot of open source projects. And honestly, there are uh, two that I'm aware of from a CNCF perspective. So Litmus Chaos, as I mentioned before, is one of the projects that I work with. The GitHub is um, on the slide. Uh, you can find our uh, experiments, the uh, Chaos Help that I mentioned before in the slide as well. And uh, we're on Twitter as well on uh, the handle at the rate uh, Litmus Chaos. So um, Chaos Mesh is another uh, CNCF project for Chaos Engineering. And these, uh, these are the details for that as well. And uh, should you wish to start contributing, there are a variety of areas to get started with. It's not just uh, 
uh, you know, code base or documentation. You, you have a lot of things to explore within an open source system or an open source ecosystem. And I hope you'll join us because it's really fun. And uh, I, I honestly got to learn a new technology and a new discipline altogether. So um, I'd highly recommend uh, for everyone to get involved in open source. Um, these are the resources that um, I can sort of uh, give you all for the comparison with should you all, um, you know, want to go through a more detailed list of how one um, chaos engineering tool compares to the others in the list. So these are there on the slide. And uh, let's keep the conversation going because um, I'm always open to learning more and um, hearing more from a um, different perspective because I come from a systems admin background and honestly I uh, I keep cribbing that uh, well, you know I don't get to hear much from the developer's perspective so I'm happy to keep a conversation going about chaos engineering open source uh, or even systems to be honest uh, so you can find me on all of these uh, at all of these places and uh, please do connect if uh, that's something that interests you. So yeah, I think that we're done for the day then. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dina. I'll make sure to get in touch with you and connect with you on LinkedIn. And some other work. Thank you for that. That was very interesting. You know, there's a saying in Italy. Can you hear me? There's a yep, saying. Absolutely. There's a very common saying in Italy, and it says. Uh, by Yandus in power, that means we learn a lot from learning. And that's just yes, what you were going absolutely. on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm, thank you so much for that. Uh, Dina. If, you, if anyone who wanted to attend uh, couldn't make it, you'll receive a link to your presentation. So feel free to share it as soon as I send it to you. Okay. Yes, I'll just share it in the chat for everyone to be aware yeah. of, and I'll send it to you as well. Yeah, yeah, send whatever you want in the chat. Feel free to send whatever you want in the chat. I don't see any questions. So I think uh, okay. that we can move on to the, the next speaker, Ashita. Uh, thank you so much, Divya, again.